Okay, let's next talk about L trypti or uh, sorry, L tyrosine. Now, tyrosine is super important amino acid. It produces or it's a precursor to the catecholamine. So, um, catecholamines being adrenaline as well as noradrenaline. Some people call it uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. But also dopamine. So these are you know extremely important neurotransmitters. We look at the catecholamines here. We, these these are you know important for your ability to tolerate and handle stress. Um, they're and, you know so so again when we're stressed out we make more adrenaline to help us cope and adapt to that stress. Adrenaline gives energy. Adrenaline helps with brain clarity. Um, so very important that you get adequate tyrosine in your diet to support, especially when you're under more stress. And this is what, what a lot of times what we'll see when people, this is especially true of women, by the way, that when they're under tremendous periods of stress, um, their brain fog is one of the major issues that happens. They end up with a lot of anxiety. Um, and this can be as a result of the deficiency of the ability to produce adrenaline and noradrenaline. And also as well, dopamine. Dopamine deficiency can cause those symptoms as well. Dopamine also plays a role in motor coordination. So that's muscles, how your muscles move and how well they're coordinated. We'll see sometimes people develop tremors. If you've heard of Parkinson's disease, for example, it's a, it's a disease where uh, dopamine production is diminished as a result of inflammatory damage in the nervous system. But So muscle motor coordination, but also motivation. Dopamine, very, very important. So dopamine def deficiencies can lead to depression, apathy, lack of motivation, lack of desire, drive to want to do much. And so again, you can't make these three neurochemicals without tyrosine. Tyrosine is the backbone of these chemicals. I mean, you need, also you need things like copper and vitamin C you know, to, to, to take tyrosine through this pathway. But um, Again, L-tyrosine, very important in that regard. Now, L-tyrosine is also extremely important to produce thyroid hormone. As a matter of fact, the T and T4, so T4 is, is kind of an abbreviation. If you've ever had your lab tests done, your thyroid test done, T4 is in it kind of, T4 is thyroid hormone, right? So T4. The T is tyrosine, and then T4 has to be converted into T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. Same thing here. The T is tyrosine. The, by the way, the 4 and the 3 represent iodine. For those of you who are interested, iodine, also an important nutrient that plays a role in thyroid hormone production. But lack of tyrosine will reduce your body's capacity to make thyroid hormone. Now, Super important if you're using tyrosine supplementally, if you plan on taking it, and you're on thyroid medication. So if you're on thyroid medication, maybe you've got a hypothyroid diagnosis, Hashimoto's, um, and you're on meds and you're gonna start taking tyrosine, one of the things that can happen is it can increase your T4 and your T3. And, and, and in effect, your medicine work better you know, in some cases, I would say, is it your medicine working better or is it just nature helping you do what your body already knows how to do? Um, either way, you don't want to end up in a state where your thyroid, you know, where your thyroid hormone is now too strong, it's too high. This can create heart problems, uh, heart palpitations, night flashes, hot sweats, um, different types of symptoms associated when your, when your thyroid medicine goes up and it, or your thyroid uh, hormone levels go up as a result of combining these two. So again, if you're thinking about using this it's, it's, and you're taking the medicine, it's good to have a conversation with your doctor, monitor, again, you can measure tyrosine uh, before you even get started, but you can also monitor your TSH, your T3, your T4, what I call, or what is called your reverse T3, 
and see what's happening with these numbers as you start this. Because again, this is just like I was talking about a moment ago with, with um, tryptophan uh, and serotonin. It's that taking a lot of this can lead to more of this, which can make potentially for a toxic situation. So you just wanna make sure when you add this in, you could, you're monitoring. Now, as far as dosing is concerned with tyrosine 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day is a good place to start for an adult. Um, again, but if you're gonna do that, testing something I would highly encourage you to do. So, um, very simple to get L-tyrosine over the, you can get it over the counter. I mean, if it comes as a free form amino acid, and of course you can also make sure that you're eating enough ample quantities in food and where you're gonna get the bulk of your tyrosine from your diet is gonna be in animal meats. Uh, and so, um, again, vegetarians, if, if you're avoiding all animal foods, animal byproducts, you, definitely I would encourage you to check your levels to make sure that you're not becoming depleted as time goes on. Okay, let's talk about L-glutamine. L-glutamine is an amino acid. We were talking about earlier, we were talking about cysteine or NAC, N-acetylcysteine. Well, glutamine is, is also part of what helps to produce glutathione. So I said glutathione earlier was NAC was, was one of the most important ingredients to go into produ producing that, but glutamine is also one of those important ingredients. So you need glutamine to make glutathione. Now glutamine is also very, very important as a fuel for immune cells. You know, most of the cells in our body require glucose as a fuel source to, dri to drive and generate enough energy to do their functions. Well, your immune cells can use glutamine as a primary fuel source. Now, what's also interesting here is that so can the cells of your small intestine. So your intestinal cells also use glutamine as a fuel source. We see this a lot where, um, where people have immune problems, where their, their white blood cell counts are low, they're not producing adequate quantities, we use L-glutamine, boom, white counts start to climb, they can start to go back up. It's because, again, glutamine can be used as a fuel source in the immune cells. Now, a lot of people, there's a lot of folks talking about using L-glutamine for leaky gut. And this is the reason why. The intestine cells, okay, need L-glutamine to generate or drive their energy production. And so if they don't have enough energy um, through glutamine, then those cells, remember they have to turn over, they have to recycle every two to seven days. If they don't have the fuel source they need, those cells get old, they become less effective at doing their work, and so we can get a breach of the intestinal barrier. So leaky gut can set in. And there are a number of research studies looking at L-glutamine with the barrier of the GI tract and, and looking at it for this very reason. So again, L-glutamine, very, very critical for the intestinal uh, fuel, but also for immune cell fuel. Now, one of my favorite ways to use L-glutamine is in surgical trauma. It's like a fracture, broken bone. But also in a workout recovery. So if you've ever had a surgery, especially a major surgery like a hip replacement, um, you know, where they have to cut deep and, and, um, and there's a lot of blood loss and there's a lot of, of potential for damage during the surgery, spinal surgeries can be the same way. Your body needs to recover and repair that, you know, surgery is basically scheduled trauma, right? So this is, it's a form of purposeful trauma, uh, just like, uh, a broken bone um, requires a lot of nutrients to heal and re-knit and repair that bone. So when these two kind of we look at as the same for recovery, L-glutamine supplementation can be very, very powerful. As a matter of fact, uh, I used to run a rehab clinic for a number of years. We would use L-glutamine. We'd use anywhere from four to five grams in some cases a day of L-glutamine supplement to help patients recover. And you know, generally what we saw, and we did comparatives, we saw people that would, that would do this 
would heal in the order of, you know, anywhere from one and a half to three times faster than people who would not do it. So it's very, very, can be very, very helpful if you've had trauma or if you've had surgery. It's also very helpful for those of you who work out very aggressively and you're trying to find a way to reduce your muscle soreness to improve your, uh, or reduce your downtime in terms of that muscle recovery. L-glutamine, even this, at the same dose, and, and you know, there's some studies that show that doses up, up, upwards of 30 grams a day are perfectly safe over long durations, although I would say be cautious with L-glutamine because you get the dose too high. Some people get headaches, some people have diarrhea, so you know, this is relatively a safe range for most, um, but if you're gonna go higher than that, just be cautious and kind of slowly, incrementally try to increase it, and if you start getting symptoms, you know to back off. But again, L-glutamine can be very helpful in this regard. Now, one of the things I wanna point out, this is a great study, uh, just published a few years ago. You see here uh, on glutamine, the role of glutamine in the complex interaction between gut microbiota and health. So in this review, um, again, the summary here, gluten, or glutamine plays an important role in gut microbiota and immunity, increasing the production one of, its, one of its functions is it increases the production of something called secretory immunoglobulin A, or SIG-A. So those of you that, that, that don't know what SIG-A is, SIG-A is an, uh, it's a protein, it's an antibody that you produce in your mouth, you produce it in your GI tract, it's produced in your lungs, and what it, it acts like a handcuff. So, so it's a general non-specific antibody. You know, every time we eat, every time we breathe, there's chemicals and toxins in the food we eat, in the air we breathe, well the job of IgA is to bind those chemicals, those toxins, so that we can neutralize them. Like a handcuff neutralizes a bad guy. If a police officer is arresting somebody, puts them in cuffs, so he doesn't have to fight them the entire way to the police station, well your immune system uses IgA, secretory IgA is a handcuff of sorts to neutralize uh, potential dangerous toxins and, and prepare them for excretion or expulsion out of the body. So you need glutamine to properly produce IgA, secretory IgA, as well as immuno, just pure immunoglobulin A. And you see in this case, they're talking about in the intestinal lumen, which again in the GI tract. Also in the management of obesity, bacterial translocation and community. So, so one of the things that can happen in a gut, if the gut's leaking, Let's make some room and let's draw. So if we, we look at kind of the generally the, the gut, it's like a tube. And it's lined with cells. And if we have a gap in between these cells, Uh, that's what we call leaky, right? Leaky gut or intestinal hyperpermeability. Now behind the gut wall, you have this massive conglomeration of immune tissue called the gall, the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. Um, inside the gut, you have all kinds of, you know, particulate bacteria, bacterial toxins, but it's one kind of toxin called LPS, lipopolysaccharide. When it permeates through, it will stimulate the GALT, but it will also traverse to your liver through the portal circulation, and it can damage the liver, increasing the risk for the development of what's known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, this is one of the ways that, that we can actually get fat stored in the liver. We can get you know, pre-cirrhosis of the liver, dam just damage to the liver cells in general. And so what this is talking about here in this study is bacterial translocation would refer to bacteria, you know, crossing or translocating, right, coming from the gut lumen into the gut and then subsequently on into the bloodstream through the liver, but also the toxins that the bacteria produces. So we could get LPS in there. We could also get different bacteria and other bacterial toxins as well, translocating across the lumen of the gut and then getting access to the, uh, to the bloodstream directly leading to this chronic and systemic inflammatory cascade. So um, we know that glutamine plays a role in maintaining this barrier, going back to the point here. 
The study also discusses how glutamine affects the cytokines, so the different cytokines that are produced to regulate and modulate inflammation that glutamine plays a role in and plays a you know, modulation role in. But also this, this um, also discusses the management of side effects during post-chemotherapy and constipation period. So patients that have gone on chemotherapy, a lot of times they damage their gut, opening their gut up for this type of again, translocation and the importance of glutamine here to seal that gut back up to prevent some of that damage. So many of you may be out there watching this, getting treated for cancer, you know, your post chemotherapy, your gut's blown open, your immune system is, is reeling from the chemo and you're trying to make a recovery, you might look at glutamine as a potential ally um, to help that recovery, to help support it.